welcome to the panel on the future of uh, uh, data protection. Sorry for the little delay. Um, uh, I will quickly explain uh, how we will proceed. Uh, we have one hour, so uh, I will first shortly introduce the four speakers. They will speak for about 10 minutes and give their point of view and feedback on the subject. And then for uh, the last uh, quarter or 20 minutes, we will have uh, take questions from, uh, from the public, from you, uh, and uh, the speakers will, uh, will answer. Um, so, uh, first, uh, Dr. Jan Brown, your uh, Associate Director of Oxford University's Security Center and Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford In Internet Institute. Uh, your research is focused on information security, privacy enhancing te technologies and internet regulation. Uh, you can speak now. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm Delighted to be here at the launch of the Euro Pirates. Um, I'm, I'm going to briefly pick up on three area, policy areas mainly, although I'll link that to technology, um, about the, the near and medium term future of data protection, uh, particularly with a European focus. So first of all, the, the, the very obvious thing to say, the, uh, the progress of the data protection regulation, I think the um, it, it was very positive that the uh, European Parliament was able to come to a reasonably strong text that they agreed on in the Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs Committee and which the, um, the full Parliament just about 10 days ago uh, approved. So I, that's very good. I think there are one or two things in there such as the um, policy around pseudonymous data that could maybe do with a bit more work, but uh, I don't think we could have hoped for a great deal more from um, that text. Of course, the important issue then is persuading the Council of Ministers to move uh, in agreeing um, the regulation. The problem, you might be aware, is not just the UK uh, holding things up in the Council of Ministers, but even, surprisingly, um, very pro-privacy countries like Germany, which in some ways would like to see stronger standards, especially in the public sector, have, uh, have also um, teamed up with the UK so that there's not been nearly the, the progress. And there is concern, and I hope this is something that the pirates that are elected to the next European Parliament can take up about um, whether the, the loss of momentum over this European Parliament election and with the appointment of a new commissioner will, will mean that that will really slow down, and whereas I think the opposite is important. That we, we really need to speed up with the data protection regulation because I think it, in, uh, it has a lot of positive changes to the overall uh, European regime. Secondly, within the EU, and a, a key area, and this is something that the the, uh, the Greens and Pirate Group have done a lot on in this parliament, and I hope again we'll, we'll look at in the next parliament, is on the data retention directive. I'm sure you're all aware of that and how much controversy it's caused, uh, the, the ongoing criticism of it from not just the data, national data protection authorities, but also the various um, constitutional courts of the member states that have been asked to look at it. Uh, Although, the, uh, although DG Home, the responsible part of the Commission, is um, looking to, to have significant reform, so they are talking about reducing and harmonizing the retention period further. It can be between six and 24 months at the moment that data is retained about people's internet use. Reducing that to, to, I, to six, I think, between six and 12 months is likely. Um, clarifying the data that's retained, setting minimum standards for use of the data because some of the member states allow law enforcement action agencies to get access to that data uh, for much lower standards than others. Um, but I think certainly from a rights perspective, uh, we would want to go further. I think actually the case really has still not yet been made for the the principle of retention at all. There is still a lot of debate, and this isn't helped by the fact that many of the member states keep very poor statistics about how useful the, the data retained under the Data Retention Directive actually is for law enforcement purposes. Uh, certainly, the, uh, some of the constitutional courts, particularly the Romanian Constitutional Court, have said very strongly that data retention voids the whole principle of data protection. So I think that's something the next parliament has to really uh, push back, back against the member states uh, 
in particular, I think it's the UK, Italy, and France that are very keen on the idea of data retention and say we need better evidence that it's really necessary before intruding on the, on the privacy of all European internet users. Then thirdly, and I'll go into a, just a little bit more detail on this, uh, the response of the EU, uh, and in particular the European Parliament, to all of the Edward Snowden revelations. Uh, the, the Civil Liberties Committee, again, has done, I think, a very good review of these issues over the last six months. Uh, their report was just endorsed by the full Parliament uh, just nine days ago, and they've made a number of suggestions. I'll pick up a few that I think are important, and I hope uh, will persuade you um, that are issues that you should be thinking about, both at the national level in convincing the member states and in Brussels now and in the next Parliament to take this up again. Um, so. First of all, and, and perhaps most important, is that the, the principles of privacy, data protection, the, the fundamental rights that are in the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights, that are in the European Convention on Human, Human Rights, do apply just as much to the activities of European intelligence agencies as they do to law enforcement agencies and to all other activities of government. When you have discussions with people from the intelligence world, uh, you can see that they often would like to think that at the very least they, they should have a lot of leeway in complying with privacy rules. They, they just think about these things in a very different way, even to law enforcement agencies, which, although they're not perfect, um, are much more used to the idea of complying and working within a human rights framework. So I think that's very important. And there are some uh, campaign groups around Europe that have taken cases in national courts and at the European Court of Human Rights uh, also to try and insist on that, particularly with regard to the UK. If, if you've been following all of the activities that our national security agency equivalent, GCHQ, has been doing in terms of internet interception, you'll know that UK law clearly leaves a lot to be desired in terms of protecting internet users' privacy. Um, I'll put it no more strongly than that. Um, secondly, from uh, what the European Parliament has asked for that I think is important, the member states so far have held on very strongly to the idea that national security is, is purely a national competence, that the European Union institutions should not be getting uh, involved in debates over um, in, in intelligence agency interception of internet communications. Uh, I think the, the Parliament's report quite rightly said, well, you can, you can take that so far, but there are a lot of cross-border issues that can only really be dealt with at the EU, uh, at the EU level. One, of course, would be when it comes to the, mem the member states that are spying on each other's citizens. You can talk about protection at the national level of rights of citizens of those countries, although the, the European Convention on Human Rights should not be uh, th those rights are not limited to nationals of countries in practice. Of course, they are the voters that politicians will care about, but I think the EU institutions do need to play a role, not least because the Treaty on the European Union, you may remember, says that the member states should, there is a principle of sincere cooperation. The European Parliament said, well, doesn't that mean that the member states should not be conducting intelligence activities on each other's territories and spying on each other's citizens? There's a ever ever growing body of EU law that enables law enforcement cooperation. So rather than spying on each other, you would hope that the member states would be cooperating with each other in tackling threats like terrorism, which of course are, are very important for them uh, to do so. A third point um, I think that's important that's come from the European Parliament that needs more work is the level of oversight by national parliaments and again ideally by the European Parliament of intelligence activities. So uh, just to give you an example, I, I, I couldn't resist telling you this because I saw it the other day and, and could barely um, believe what I was seeing at a hearing of the UK Parliament uh, where the Intelligence Services Commissioner, who was the individual that's supposed to oversee the activities of the UK intelligence agencies, ensure they're complying with the law, was um, being reluctantly questioned by the uh, British Parliament, uh, by a select committee. First of all, they had to, he, ref he had refused to appear before them. They had to actually use their powers as a parliamentary committee to summon him to come and give evidence to the parliament, which he only very reluctantly did. But uh, the, the, the chairman of the committee asked him, when you heard 
the, the Snowden revelations, were you surprised and what actions did you take, if any, to make sure what was happening was being done within uh, the UK legal framework? Um, uh, and the, um, the intelligence services commissioner said, well, when I heard this, I was, I was a bit shocked and uh, I thought maybe the, they, they, they had been fooling me all this time, the intelligence agency, so I rushed down to GCHQ, which is in Cheltenham in the, in the middle, middle of England, and he had lunch with the deputy director, not even the director, um, and, I, and the director convinced him, basically, that everything was fine. Uh, the, the chairman of the, the British Parliament Committee said, okay, so you had a discussion with them? Yes. You heard what they had to say? Certainly. And you accepted what they had to say? Certainly. Is that it? Asked the committee chairman. Certainly, replied the Intelligence Services Commissioner. Just a discussion? Certainly. That was it. That was the, that was the um, extent of the oversight that was going on from the, the Intelligence Services Commissioner, who, by the way, only works 100, about 120 days a year, he told the Parliamentary Committee. He's not even full-time. He has a secretary, and that's it. Uh, the committee asked him if he thought he needed more resources to oversee this £1 billion a year, roughly, intelligence agency GCHQ, plus... Uh, plus other intelligence agencies also in the UK, and he said no. He was very happy that as a former senior judge, he would go and talk to uh, people at GCHQ and the other agencies, and he trusted them. He thought they had a good ethos, uh, he said, which I, th I think clearly is not what you would hope, the level of oversight that you would hope for from, uh, from a, a national um, official like that. So I think that's something the European Parliament was right to highlight uh, that, that needs a lot more work, and something that I would imagine a lot of, uh, a lot of you would be uh, interested in, would agree with, and might even in the longer term be able to help with, which is the technical expertise that intelligence agency oversight bodies need if they're going to have any idea what people like GCHQ uh, and the NSA are doing. The, the, the technology that is being deployed is really something that most of the people on parliamentary select committees and intelligence oversight agencies uh, are not very familiar with. So look at ways that you might get involved in, you know, in responding to parliamentary um, consultations, on perhaps giving evidence to parliamentary committees when they ask for it about the technical side of this. I saw someone say last week, and I thought this was a very apt comment in the US, if you have been following the angry debate between the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and the CIA over the fact that um, they're both accusing each other of having um, wrongfully denied or accessed classified documents to the level where they're, where they're getting the Department of Justice. They're, try, they're both trying to persuade the Department of Justice to prosecute the other side. And the, the chairwoman of the, that committee, Diane Feinstein, who's, in, who's generally a very firm supporter of the US intelligence agencies, gave this tremendously angry speech in the Senate uh, last week saying, um, you know, this is a constitutional crisis, essentially, that the Congressional Committee, supposedly overseeing the CIA, supposedly trying to prevent very serious criminal activity, like the torturing of people that are being interrogated by the CIA, as seems to have happened, are now being in turn spied on by the CIA itself, the CIA even trying to prosecute Senate committee staff. So if the, if the Senate can't oversee the CIA and torture, which is something which is pretty straightforward and recognizable as a breach of international law and most senators could understand, how on earth can they oversee the National Security Agency? And then my fi very final point linked to that, uh, again something I'm, I imagine you would all be very interested in that the European Parliament has highlighted is that European IT capability clearly needs to be improved and they said uh, uh, as much as possible, it should be based on open standards and open source software and, if possible, hardware, making the whole supply chain from processor design to application layer transparent and reviewable. So, I, again, I think that's something that's a very positive idea that can be pushed further on the political level but also on the technology level. So people that are technologists, programmers, uh, researchers in universities and in companies can look at how they can contribute towards making that 
happen, and also in developing tools that anyone can use, whether that's European governments, European companies and individuals, or uh, people in other, other areas of the world, to verify the security properties of software. Because as Jacob, Jacob Applebaum was just saying in the previous session, if you don't have encryption, if you don't have secure software, if you don't try and avoid all of the possibilities for exploitation and malware that we know that the NSA has been spending a lot of money exploiting, uh, then you're going to have a great difficulty in, in practice is protecting Europeans' privacy and data. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I will now uh, give the power to uh, Thomas Zerdik. Uh, you're an attorney and published author. You're specialized in laws about European Union, IT, and data protection. Um, after holding positions at the DG for Internal Markets and the DG for Enlargement, you are currently in Policy Officer in the Personal Data Protection Unit at the European Commission's Directorate General for Justice. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm also the Head of Sector in DG Justice for the Data Protection Reform, and that's why I'm grateful to be here and grateful to... Um, fill you a bit in and update you on um, the point of view of the European Commission. Because as you know, it's not only the European Parliament who is very active at the moment at shaping the future of data protection, it's also the European Commission. Um, let's be clear for us, mass surveillance of e electronic communications of ind individuals and of businesses is unacceptable. And the European Commission has and is active within five areas where we're trying to make things right and where we're trying to shape the future of data protection. Um, Ian has already mentioned, of course, the major thing, which is the data protection reform. Um, just to recap on why this is important and why this is the major uh, issue for the European Commission at the moment, we have European legislation already on data protection, on how should personal data, personal information be used, be processed, um, secured um, by companies, by public authorities, um, by individuals, and what rights can the individual exercise and make, um, make an end and apply. Um, since 2009, we are in the process of updating those rules. In 2012, the European Commission has made two proposals in that respect what we call the package approach, we have proposed a general data protection regulation, which is supposed to be the future rules for data protection in the European Union. And we've also proposed a directive for data protection rules for law enforcement, for essentially police and criminal justice authorities in the Union. <clears throat> All of these proposals, as the, current, um, pro as the current rules already, also have rules on how to deal with international transfers. So what happens when personal data is accessed by uh, people abroad or sent to uh, other countries. We've also heard that um, there has been another milestone recently, um, namely the positioning of the European Parliament in its first reading. Let me translate, that's the official first position of the European Parliament when it comes to those major legislative proposals. And that's very significant because it means that two years after the Commission has proposed legislative proposals, we have a position from one co-legislator from the European Parliament. We know where the Parliament stands and we can now, as a Commission, find our position towards what the Parliament has proposed to change and it's also good for the other co-legislator, the council, the member states, to find a common approach. Um, I don't want to bore you with um, all the technical details of the data protection regulation. It's just, just to mention it that what this is all about. This is about to make sure that European data protection rules will be more uniform. Currently, we have a framework, a directive, which is differently implemented and interpreted in 28 member states of the Union. We are proposing to get rid of that and have one, one single text, namely a regulation. Um, that's the idea behind it. We are proposing that 
European data protection rules should apply, irrespectively if um, somebody is processing the data here in Europe or in another country. So we want to get rid of the arguments, for example, of Google um, in a pending court case with the European Court of Justice where Google says, I don't have to apply European data protection law because I am Google Inc. and I sit in California. That's the first uh, line of defense they bring in legal arguments and we're trying to uh, take that first line of defense away by saying if you're offering goods and services to Europeans, then you have to apply data protection rules. Or if you're monitoring the behavior of Europeans, then please, you need to apply data protection rules made in Europe. We're also proposing things like the right to be forgotten. Um, we are um, advocating a right to, right to data portability, that you can transfer your data from one service provider to another. Um, we strongly advocate data protection by design, data protection by default, um, data breach notifications. Those are just some of the issues which we are putting in for the first time into European laws for data protection. And we hope that once we have those, they will also be stronger enforced. How do we do this? We are also proposing to have supervisory authorities, national data protection supervisory authorities, which do not, as they currently do, have a different view from member state to member state. My neighbor on the right will know what I'm talking about. Um, 28 member states at the moment makes 28 different interpretations of the law and 28 different cultures how to apply the law. Um, this cannot be because we are faced with things which are by nature global or pan-European. So it doesn't make sense to have, for example, the Czech supervisory authority take a decision which goes against a decision on the same topic from the German supervisory authority. Um, increased enforcement also means um, heavy fines. We are proposing for companies who violate these new rules to have 2% uh, of the annual worldwide turnover to be fined. Something, by the way, which the European Parliament has liked very much and actually proposed to increase that to 5% of the annual worldwide turnover of a company. Last but not least, the package approach. I said a directive for police and criminal justice authorities. Um, this is necessary because the current legal framework in the European Union does not cover national or purely domestic processing of personal data by police forces. Um, so we're proposing to cover everything they do so that we have a coherent framework. Um, quick outlook on the timetable. Um, Ian already mentioned there is some resistance, not in the parliament anymore, we have the position, but there is some resistance from member states um, to go ahead. At the same time, we see now movement. The European Parliament's position is on the table. Um, there's been two years discussion, so we are quite uh, optimistic that we might get a good text by the end of this year. And just a small correction, um, Germany um, is blocking not because they want higher standards for the public sector. No, Germany doesn't want higher standards for the public sector. Germany doesn't want standards set by the EU for the public sector, and that's why they don't want a regulation. They prefer a directive on this, which is um, not really understandable given that personal data are both in the public sector, in the private sector. The current rules already apply both in both sectors. We see no need for differentiation. And when you look at the higher standards um, in Germany, these fit perfectly within the scope of the proposed regulation. We have four other things which we're very busy with at the moment. Um, uh, you will know, you will heard about the safe harbor. We have problems with our current safe harbor um, framework where European companies are authorized to transfer personal data to companies in the US who have subscribed to the safe harbor principles because there is a national security exemption clause and we have grave concerns that in the light of the Edward Snowden's revelations, obviously, 
this national security exemption clause can be misused. We have proposed changes to be implemented uh, by this year in summer, uh, to be implemented by the US counterparts. We'll see what we get out of that. We're also negotiating at the moment a, a data protection standards agreement between the European Union and the United States for police and law enforcement. Um, our aim there is to establish general principles for data protection, to make it clear that data protection is a fundamental right, that it also applies in police and law enforcement work, and that there shouldn't be any distinction or any discrimination between nationality or residence, which is currently the, the, the place, uh, which is currently the, uh, happening, and that if there is an issue, that Europeans have judicial redress in the United States as well. Um, there are other fora which are equally important on the international level. It's not only the US, it's also at the level of the Council of Europe, where, as you might know, another important legal instrument, a convention on data protection, is also being revised, and we're trying to um, make it as modern as possible and to be in line with what we're proposing in the European Union. I think I'll stop it here. Um, this has been a tour de force um, over what we in the Commission do in our unit on data protection. Um, 15 people divided in three sectors. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, giving the parole to uh, Katja de Vries. Uh, you have degrees in law, psychology, philosophy and domains. You are now a PhD student uh, uh, in legal philosophy at Fraser University in Brussels. Sorry for my accent. Uh, you study the collisions and interactions between legal and technological modes of thinking, and in particular, the impacts of advanced data technologies uh, like profiling and data mining on legal semantics. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Well, as you already heard, I, I'm not a traditional legal scholar. I am a legal scholar. I follow everything that happens uh, in these buildings about data protection with enormous interest, and I, I read all legal texts. But I also have a, a, a training as a philosopher, mainly I did research in uh, philosophy and his the, the philosophy and history of uh, statistics, probability, uh, new forms like profiling, machine learning, data mining. So you could say I'm a bit of a philosopher of information, maybe. And that makes that, you know, even though I only have 10 minutes, I'm going to take a little bit of a more uh, theoretical, historical uh, stance, because I think in this session, when we are talking about the future of data protection, when you're want to make a prediction about the future, it's good to you know, have several data points so that you can extrapolate where, where we are going. So uh, what, what I specifically want to talk about uh, in this short introduction is profiling. If you look at the, uh, the, the old uh, data, uh, data protection directive, you see that the word profiling is not there, but at the moment profiling has become the, the buzzword. The, uh, the Council of Europe wrote a recommendation about profiling in 2011. The Working Party 29 wrote, wrote uh, an opinion about profiling. Profiling is everywhere and it's also in the, 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 new, uh, in the, in the newly proposed uh, regulation. So, because I never can completely uh, remember it, I will read it. Uh, in, in the definitions in Article 4, it says profiling means any form of automated processing of personal data intended <laughs> to evaluate certain personal aspects relating to a natural person or to analyze or predict in particular that natural person's performance at work, economic situations, location, health, personal preferences, re reliability, or behavior. So what we see here is a description of situations that you know, might feel a bit uncanny when you, you try to get into a plane and they say you are the wrong risk category, you don't fit in the right profile. If you go to a bank when they say, no, you cannot get that mortgage because you don't fit the profile. 
th there's a lot of talking about profiling, but the description that is given in, uh, in, the, in the proposed re uh, regulation is more about what happens to you as a subject, as a citizen, as a data subject, uh, how, how it feels that you, will be, uh, uh, that you will be evaluated, that there will be predictions that will be made. But I would like to think a bit more about you know, how, how is it that it's happening and what, what kind of technology are we talking about? What is new compared to the situation in 1995 when the, the, the previous directive was made. And to do that, I want to go back even, even further. So, you know, data practices, as we all know, are, you know, as long as there have been humans, we have been dealing with data. So, you know, even in the, the, the early Neolithic, you know, the, the cavemen made little knots in ropes to remember the genealogy of a family, you know, to keep track of property. Now, data processing, not necessarily personal data processing, but data processing is a very ancient practice. And what you see that in the, in the 18th century, something interesting happens, a field uh, uh, statistics emerges, that states, uh, hence the word statistics, are going to keep track of populations. And this is also, you know, it contributes to the building of the nation state that, you know, the, the Belgian state in the 19th century says, we have 20,000 fertile women and France says, but we have 30,000 <coughs> fertile women. It becomes part of identity building and it changes the relation of the state to the population. The, the, the ruler is not just interested in land, but actually thinks I have this population and they are like my flock and I have to keep them safe and get more fertile women, get more conscriptable men that can go and fight for me. This, this becomes, uh, it changes the relationship of, of the state to, to the citizens. And what, what you see is that in the 1960s, when you get first f ideas that we, we will have computers, and then you get developments, personal computers in the 1970s, the first ideas about data protection arises, that even though there, there is computerization, there is still a, a bit of a mind frame of this state that kind of keeps static information, that keeps track of demographics and also of uh, the, the, the secret police that keeps track of individuals. Uh, John Doe has done this. John Doe attends trade union uh, uh, sessions. Uh, maybe we should keep track of him. And what we see now is that the, the information in profiling, or actually what I look at is more machine learning, data mining, it's not longer static information, but it's information at work. It's not information that's just static. No, you, you make inferential jumps. You say, if, if you eat this brand of cornflakes and read this newspaper, and if you are interested in that, then this might happen. So you make a jump. It's no longer descriptive, it's, it's very inferential. And that is a new type of knowledge that, that you have to deal with. Second point, what we see now, which is also slightly different to the situation in which the, the, the former data protection directive uh, came about, was that when we talk about statistics, in the 1990s of the previous century, it's still a bit of a scientific practice. There is still a lot of talk about popper, uh, whether something you have a hypothesis, it can be falsified. And that knowledge of statistics has moved a lot to intelligence services, commercial applications, and the, the scientific standards that, that you use to apply to statistics have become different. They are not as stringent anymore, even though you use similar, similar statistical technologies, apart from the fact that you have bigger machines now, more computation, 
there is not the same stringent <coughs> ethics about what is good statistics, what is bad statistics, what is good machine learning, what's bad machine learning. And if, if there are if there are rules to say, uh, you, you, I mean, within the community of machine learning, you have all kinds of competitions, a Kaggle competition, and then you can say this algorithm works better than another algorithm. But you lack the kind of strong scientific ethics about how, how these statistics should work. So there you have a difference between the 1995 situation and the current situation in which the uh, the new data protection regulation is made. Then, so we, we have already two differences. Third difference, we, if we look at current machine learning uh, technologies, there, there is a matter of indirectness. So let me explain. The, the word machine learning is very telling here. You're trying to learn a machine, a model, and there you create indirectness. So, Let's give a basic example. If, if I have a computer, I can say a, a terrorist is somebody who comes from country X, is going to these book, bookshops, is, uh, is attending these chat boxes on the internet, then I create a top-down model. I tell the computer, I give a top-down instruction about how a terrorist look like. Or if I am a bank, I can give a top-down instruction to a machine about how, how a good customer should look or not. But now with machine learning, you create a bit of indirectness because you basically give instructions to the machine that are more general. You, you explain the machine how it can learn by example, or you explain to the machine how it can recognize similarity. And we all know, so let's give an example. If you have a small child and you're trying to, to teach the child what a dog is, by example, and you, you tell the child, that's a dog, that's a dog, that's a dog, and then suddenly the child points at a horse and says, dog, then something went wrong because you're teaching by example, you haven't just implanted the rule in the head of the child, no. You have been trying to teach by example, and there surprising things can happen. And in the same way, also with machines, if you create machine learning, if there is a difference between the algorithm that creates the model, is if it's not directly the programmer that creates the model, some, some surprising things can happen. And this is very relevant, because in data protection, we value transparency highly. But sometimes you now see the situation that even the programmer is kind of surprised by the categorization, the clustering, and this is a, a huge question how to deal with that, how to give meaningful information in the, in the regulation. They say that you have the right to get meaningful uh, information about the profiling that happens. That's a huge question how, how to do that. Fourth point, which is significant, which is new about <laughs> the, the, the current machine learning, is that, so, so of course all the old data practices still exist. We still, have, uh, we still have the bank that tries to identify specific information about person X. We still have the, the NSA that tries to get information about specific person X. But at the same time, you also get all kind of data practices in which it's not so much about learning the truth about something, finding out, the, uh, identifying the right information about a specific person, but about what, what the information does. It's not so much about representation, but about getting, for instance, more profit. You are a commercial company and you want to sell more cookies. Well, then you want an algorithm that will, will send advertisements to people so that you actually sell more cookies. And there you get a very interesting point. I, I will stop in t t two minutes. You get a very interesting point that if it's not about identifying people, then actually a company or a, 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 a spying organization can say, well, we only want to know whom to target. We don't want to know the actual name of a person. And here you come in the field, and already Ian Brown mentioned it, pseudonymized data, that you can direct 
You can direct information or target without actually knowing the person. This becomes very interesting because maybe this doesn't fall under data protection law, but it might fall under anti-discrimination law, which is still underexplored. There is a bit of anti-discrimination law in, in the, uh, there is a bit of uh, the, the ideas of anti-discrimination law in, in the current uh, regulation, uh, but it's a very underexplored field because many people think if, if there is a model, it's rational, and it's probably okay, and we have to get rid of that idea because machine learning is more an art than a science, and it needs to be politically debated. And that means, now the really the last sentence, this, this relates to two other instruments that are in the regulation, namely impact assessments. What is the impact of a technology on, uh, uh, on data protection and legal protection by design? I think it's extremely important for the machine learning community to find a way to actually deal with that in a more creative way. And it would be horrible if it's left to regulators to simply check lists to see if a technology is compliant. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> and um, so finally, I uh, will. Uh, Introduce uh, Jan Voboril. You are a lawyer and executive director of the Juridictum Remedium. It's a Prague based NGO focused mostly on the issues of the relations of human rights with te new technologies. And uh, apart from seeking protection of privacy, managing strategic litigation, and uh, promoting new legislative proposals, you organized the uh, Big Brother Awards SEC Republic. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, I would like to talk, uh, first of all, uh, about uh, Juridicum Remedium, about our activities and achievements. And then I will pay my attention to the topic what is maybe a little bit in shade of, of the scandals with NSA or, or surveillance of communication. And it, it is uh, DNA databases, DNA analysis. Uh, so, Juridicum Remedium, it's an NGO from, from the Czech Republic. It was founded in 2001. Uh, our field of interest is uh, human rights in connection with, with uh, new technologies, especially digital rights or right to privacy. Uh, but we also promote, for example, Creative Commons licenses in the Czech Republic. Uh, we are a member of European Digital Rights. I don't know if you, if you know what is ADRI. It is Umbrella Association for, for 35 uh, NGOs, digital, digital rights NGOs from, from the European countries. Uh, our activities, uh, can, we, can I divide it into, into two groups? It's the first group is a watchdog activity. Uh, we monitor a lot of a lot of risks for for privacy, for example, new new CCTV systems in Czech towns, or or chip cards in public transportation, or new new governmental databases. Uh, we cooperate with media. We give uh, uh, expert opinion for media. Uh, the second group is long-term campaigns. And it is, if, if we have really some most, most important topic, then we, we will create this, this uh, long-term campaign. Uh, in the, uh, this campaign included uh, activities such as, such as uh, some uh, expert opinion, comments of, comments of legislation drafts, or, or also political lobbying, various meetings with politics, officers, and so on. Uh, maybe the biggest biggest achievements uh, in last last years or in previous years uh, was our successful constitutional complaint uh, against data retention legislation in the Czech Republic. Uh, uh, three years ago, we, we prepared the constitutional complaint proposal and and found support 55 supporters among members of parliament. And they submitted the complaint, and Czech Constitutional Court accepted all of our points of our of our complaint, and 
and uh, cancelled completely, completely the Czech legislation for data retention. Uh, I believe it is it, it has a, it had a comp impact on European level, not only on national level. Uh, what I wa would like to talking about now it is it is the problems of DNA because it is it is our current big activities of us. I believe that this topic is a little bit underestimated. It is really in the shade of, of uh, surveillance of, of, uh, of uh, cyberspace. But for example, in the Czech Republic, it is really a really <coughs> wrong situation because there is no specific specific legislation for, for this topic, for, for the DNA issues. Uh, not only for, for private sector, but also for, for criminal investigation. If you want to make, make some DNA analysis, you, you need no, no certification, no education. You can start tomorrow with this analysis. And uh, I believe that, uh, that it is a problem that the, that the number of comparative studies about, about DNA is rising and it means that a lot of information you can investigate about subject also you have only his or her DNA sample or profile. Uh, about one year ago I read about one, one research of, of uh, Israel and uh, United States researchers. Uh, they had a sample of Y chromosomes of by by 900 American men, only this Y chromosome and some comparative studies, and uh, they they were able to to identify they, their family names in, in uh, 12 percent of, of these men. Uh, so it is it is it means that it is not not still that that uh, in DNA sample sample you can you can find only only information about your, your prediction to any serious diseases or behavior or your character, but you can find there also inf information about your, your identity, about your family name. It is, it, is, it is not good news, in my opinion. Uh, in November uh, last year, we started a campaign against, against the archivation of the blood samples of newborn babies in the Czech Republic. Uh, I don't know if you, if you did ever heard about, about the newborn baby screening. Uh, it is, it is uh, uh, <coughs> I think it, is, it, it should be a good point in the discussion about the future of privacy because, because in the Czech Republic there is since since 60s uh, all newborn babies screened on on some some serious serious diseases for the purpose of of these serious diseases and and uh, what is the problem the problem is that the, the blood the, the blood sample after the screening is archived now it is it is the uh, it is archived since 1980 in the, in the Czech Republic, and now it is the archive with more than three millions of blood samples of, of newborn babies. So, so uh, I think it is not mistake to say that that uh, you have a complete, complete DNA database, complete database of DNA samples of all populations since 1980. Uh, I think it is, it is not only in the Czech Republic, I know it is also in Slovakia and, and maybe also in other, other European countries. Uh, so the point is that uh, <coughs> dangers will come not only in connection with our current activities or, or information or about our future activity on internet, for example, but we must also pay attention to the information in some Old, very old archives, uh, which were collected many years ago, and and uh, the dangers of this information will increase with with the new possibilities of DNA analysis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So uh, we will take question from uh, the audience. Uh, how many 
question do we have? Okay, so maybe we can uh, uh, process uh, with the two questions. You can take uh, the microphone, then you, and we will answer the two questions uh, afterwards. Uh, it's about the uh, DG Justice with uh, Thomas, which we met some years ago. Uh, Thomas, why don't your Justice Department, which is uh, 15 persons, of course, shows uh, their seriosity of, uh, of the European uh, uh, institutions about the Internet Justice? Uh, why don't you promote uh, the servers to be inside the European lands wherever they are, instead of negotiating with Google uh, somewhere in Hawaii or no, uh, I don't know where. Also, how about your department with the citizens' communication is still in the same situation as it was three years ago? Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jacob Dexa. I'm one of the few non-pirates here, I guess. Um, one of the main problems I've seen with data protection is awareness from the public about what your data may tell about you and what kind of data we actually give away from ourselves. Um, I know that the proposal aims to deal with some of these concerns, but it doesn't really feel sufficient. It doesn't feel like this would help the information overflow um, when it comes to our personal data. So uh, I would like some comments on how to better deal with that problem. Yes, maybe Thomas, you can answer the first question. Well, I'll try to answer the first question. We're not negotiating with Google, not, not at all. We are trying to have good standards in place in Europe as, um, as a way to make sure that our ideas on how data protection should be is uh, clear and can be enforced. And um, that's it. If other countries, or um, let's put it this way, and if, that's, that's what I said, part of that package deal is that if you want to do business in Europe, you have to comply with those rules so that you don't, as, an, as a citizen, um, you don't have to rely on something which is being negotiated in Mountain View, California. So we're not doing that. Um, we're not obliging people to store stuff uh, in Europe because that won't work. Um, even Brazil has just uh, decided that they won't be able to do this because we have an interest that companies or whoever takes up our standards and the best way to do this is to say, look, the standards in Europe are here and you, you apply it. To the second question on awareness, I agree. <clears throat> we need a lot more awareness. Um, I was hopeful to hear from you uh, your ideas on what you would like to see. We, uh, our ideas are clear. We say um, we don't want to have implicit consent, for example. If, you, if somebody asks you, what, uh, can, I, can I use your personal data? Then you have to say explicitly, yes, you can. Um, explicit consent. Um, you need more information, but at the same time, this is not the, uh, this is not the miracle, uh, the magic bullet. It's a, it's a general data protection framework, legal framework, and how these things then work out in practice, um, because data protection is so broad, it's, it's impossible to particularly say, this is how it should be there and there and there in this text. So um, in one situation, you can have a lot of information, which is not information overflow. In other situations, too much information is, is not helpful. So we will see how the principle, and the principle is important, is being implemented in specific situations. On your smartphone, it's something different than at home um, reading a parcel, because don't forget, all of this applies to the offline and the online world, so there is a lot of situations which we need to cover. But if you have good ideas on how to um, stem the information overflow, please feel free. The European Parliament had proposed something quite innovative, namely icons, a standard set of icons, which look good, but unfortunately, the way it's formulated, we'll have to discuss about this. But that's a first approach. But I'm sure my colleagues on the panel will say something to that as well. 
So who wants to take a... Um, briefly, um, actually, I, I, I don't have magic solu solutions, and I think that the difficulty of actually conveying, as, as you were saying to people, all of the different ways that data might be used uh, once it's been dis disclosed is a very tricky problem. So much so, I think that that is one of the reasons that justifies the, the European approach in general, that it's not the American approach of saying, you know, read our 20-page privacy policy, understand all the different ways your data might be used, and let the buyer beware. I think it, it, it is important to have additional protections for people as well as the, the consent requirement. And I'm, I'm all in favor of awareness, but I'm also a bit of a structuralist here. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very much in favor of the fact that companies are forced to do risk assessments, that there should be legal protection by design. I think what Lawrence Lessig writes in, the, in his last chapter of the book Code 2.0 is very correct. If I enter a building, I sh no, it's nice if I'm aware about architecture and pressure, but there should also be a rule that says that the building should be according to building regulation, so it's safe to walk in it. And I think, you know, very good awareness, but there should be a structure that you know, feels safe. Do you want to speak now? Uh, does somebody have a question, maybe? Yes, I see two persons. Maybe uh, uh, you can ask uh, first question and then a second question. My question would be to Mr. Zerdik, but also to anyone else who likes to answer it, um, about the new data protection regulation. How will it affect video surveillance in public spaces or even private places, spaces? In Germany, there are specialized rules about that. And um, as far as I know, there are no specialized rules in the data protection regulation. And I know that there are a uh, lot less strict rules in other EU countries, like, for example, Great Britain, about video surveillance. So maybe you could say something about that for me. Um, I'm coming back to the uh, awareness point you mentioned, because um, the colleague from the Czech Republic said, well, you we have this whole um, basically putting everyone that gets born in the country into a big database. So and. What about the awareness in this case? I mean, do you, is it a discussion in in the country, or does it just happen and nobody cares? Who would like to answer? You want to answer, Thomas? Yeah. Thanks. I, I start with a question on video surveillance. Um, we have general rules in the regulation. We don't have specific rules on video surveillance in the regulation. Um, first of all, because um, indeed, <clears throat> there may or may not be differences currently in 28 member states, but also because we believe in what is in the title. It's supposed to be a general data protection regulation. It needs to lay down the general principles. And um, video surveillance in public spaces is a specific situation. Um, which um, we will have to see how this is going to work out in application of the general rules. So if we have a general rules and says you should not, um, you should only process personal data if you have a legal ground or uh, to do this, and if you do this, then your um, uh, your personal data needs to be not in excessive in relation to the purposes you're going to use it for. I think that's these are good rules. And then you apply this to a specific situation. And video surveillance in public places can again comprise a broad range of different situations. It, it's the case of what does a public authority do with video surveillance in public spaces? Is this something a, an individual does by coincidence because he really wants to um, have his camera on his property and by coincidence, there is also a part of a public space involved in there. So I think this just shows you that even with an, a specific provision, you wouldn't be able to catch all the possible uh, issues um, on, on this topic. But then again, we have general principles. The general principles already apply today. We have um, our 
data protection supervisory authorities which can give guidance, and they have already done that in the case of video surveillance, um, to see how the general principles apply in different situations. And we'll also have you, if you don't like what's happening in Germany with video surveillance, you go to the supervisory authority, you go to the person indicated, saying it's video surveillance here in public space to the authorities. If you don't like what they do, what they do um, you go to court. Um, having said this, we're not regulating this because there's a lot of broad issues behind this. Um, and again, um, we still have some different cultures also in, uh, Again, in the UK, video surveillance is, a, is a, not an issue. In Germany it is, and this is why in Germany you have different rules on this, but they're also based on general principles. I don't know if that helps you, but that's the only way to explain the current EU legal situation. I can just quickly add, next to the EU, there is also the court in Strasbourg, and they say, and they say lots of interesting things about video surveillance in public spaces. That you have the Peck case, uh, the guy who tried to kill himself in a public space. So I think there can be unifying force going out from Strasbourg as well, next to the, the general data protection regulation. Mm, I would like to. Uh, uh I have a question myself, so uh, I would uh, use uh, the microphone to uh, ask it. Um, uh, when we speak about uh, 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 video um, surveillance and uh, public spaces, but uh, it has been revealed recently that uh, the um, British secret services uh, were spying the private webcam uh, conversations of some people uh, just watching at uh, photos uh, of uh, every five minutes of all the conversations on some uh, uh, webcam chat services. Um, obviously, this is a breach of privacy uh, outside of the public domain. Uh, and I would like to know uh, what is the current data protection uh, regulation in Europe uh, thinking about that? Because uh, if it's forbidden, then the British Secret Services have violated it. And if it is not for clearly forbidden, will the upcoming revision, reform of data protection prevent that? And will it be possible to sanction it at the European level? Yeah. Um. Well, what the Brits are doing there is just intercepting um, digits, bits, and, and bytes um, as everything on the internet. So there's no distinction between, no particular reason why we should uh, try to make a distinction between, oh, it's, it's, a, it's from a webcam or uh, it's just an email. It's the same thing. Um, that's what they're intercepting. The, um, the regulation I'm dealing with, I'm working with, uh, will have an indirect effect on this only. Because obviously, um, Ian has mentioned this, um, there is no EU competence as such for national security issues. Member states say and define themselves what is national security, but, and, and we, have a, we have the borderline where of course we can say um, we don't agree and the rules should be like this, and this is, that part, what I'm working on, is on the regulation. We say uh, in data, personal data should be protected. That's how it should be done. And of course, if they can be, they can be lawfully accessed in certain instances. But those accesses, those instances, need to be very carefully and and, and exceptionally and, and, and strictly defined. This is where the jurisprudence from uh, the European Court of Human Rights comes in, and also the European Court uh, in uh, Luxembourg. Um, so, we're working on the general framework. Um, these issues should be exceptional. There shouldn't be mass surveillance, and this is why I said um, for the Commission, mass surveillance is unacceptable. Um, surveillance should be limited, necessary. Um, but again, for this, we have a good framework, the European Convention of Human Rights. We have plenty of jurisprudence on this. It's a question of applying that jurisprudence in the member states, um, but I'm optimistic since there are cases 
at least one case I'm aware of, which is pending with the court in Strasbourg. And then we will hear what is proportionate necessary for national security purposes. And briefly, I'm, I wrote an expert witness statement for the case that's at the European Court. And I mean, the, the case was filed last summer, but there has just been so much more has come out about what is, what is happening that, that it's very positive that the court has fast-tracked the case and has asked the UK to respond uh, by, uh, I think, the 2nd of May. So the court is, is really prioritising it. They have a, the Court of Human Rights has a very large backlog. They still have, I think, over 100,000 cases to deal with. But they've decided that this one is so important to human rights overall in Europe, they're going to do a faster job in dealing with it. Um, we are a bit short on uh, timing, so maybe we take uh, last questions. Uh, I see a lot of hands raised. Um, maybe we take um, uh, three questions from this side of the room, and uh, um, it will be a whole uh, sorry for the other people. So, uh, can you please uh, uh, ask questions for the three persons who have uh, raised hands? All right, quickly. Um, I'm just being interested whether there are any efforts being made to um, provision within the law anything that would enforce encryption within communication. Let's say um, a messaging service that would then be encrypted from one end user to the other one and the company would have to do this. Yes, maybe please ask all the questions and then we will uh, have a final uh, speech. Um, so um, some data protection uh, authorities at the moment do a lot more work than others. I'm thinking specifically all of the multinationals that are set up in Ireland um, for tax purposes. Also, that's shifting all of the burden onto the Irish data protection um, authority, which has a tiny office next to a supermarket and has hardly any staff. Um, so uh, specifically with uh, the new regulation, um, how is the enforcement um, going to work? Is it still going to be all lumped on this one um, authority where the company is based or will it now be where the citizens are? Um, <clears throat> my, my question is for the Speaker of the European Commission. Uh, does the general framework provide for some sort of penalties if and when it becomes clear that the member states are not following the general rule, like well, in terms of massive surveillance with webcams and emails as, as previously described? That seems to me like it's not following the, the regulation's general sort of understanding. and. So does that does the regulation contain enfor some sort of enforcement mechanism? Um, yes, if you can uh, answer, and uh, every one of you can take uh, the, the parole for uh, last time, if it's okay for you. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll start. First, um, the question <coughs> on encryption and enforcing encryption between communications. Um, no, we're not saying that. Um, what we're saying, because we want to be um, technologically uh, neutral in that sense, but we're saying um, you must have state-of-the-art data security measures in place. Um, you should have privacy by design, privacy by de default, but we want to leave it in the, in the legal text up to whoever is processing personal data. So we're not saying you should encrypt. We're saying it must be state-of-the-art and uh, confidentiality of communications must be ensured. Um, so we're hoping, obviously, that that's encryption is something which will be used, because that's a way to to uh, ensure some data security. Um, but it's not the only way. So we're not saying only encryption works. Um, on the Irish TPA, um, what we're trying to do is twofold. We're, first of all, trying to harmonize 
the powers and the resources of those supervisory authorities. Because of course, if you have a lot of things to do and you have three persons in the office next to the supermarket, that seems to be a bit um, out, of, out of touch with reality. So mm -hmm. we're saying you need to have the adequate resources to deal with what you need to do. You need to be independent and what you can do should be the same all over in Europe because some of the supervisory authorities can't even fine companies. They can just go to court or have a press release. That's also ridiculous. So, um, and what we're saying effectively is um, if you are competent as a supervisory authority, for example, the one in Ireland, because the company has its main headquarters there, that's okay, you should have the last say on anything to do with data protection, but the moment um, uh, your decision would impact on other member states or on other um, citizens from other member states, you must go and talk to your colleagues in the other member states so that you find the common, if you want, a common decision of those relevant concerned supervisory authorities. Um, so in order to get a European response to a European question, if you want. If you, con if you complain as a citizen to your DPA, you can do that. We, pro we say, of course, you must be able to do this. This is the job of supervisory authorities to hear complaints from their citizens. Um, what we're saying is, if you do this and the company sits in Ireland, then your local DPA has an obligation to again cooperate and work together with the Irish DPA, they must find a common solution and then see that the regulation is enforced. Which brings me to the last point, um, enforcement against member states. Yes, we have stronger enforcement in the regulation, but that's the enforcement against controllers, so everybody who, who processes the personal data. When we find that a member state does not comply with the rules, we as the commission, we have institutional powers to go against the member state. For this mass surveillance in the national security field, um, that is going to be uh, more difficult, as I said before. Um, we don't have direct competence for looking at what member states do. We have the competence to make sure that whatever member states do doesn't harm, doesn't infringe the European Union's treaties and norms. And there we're looking at. So we're looking at you see, and, and we're looking at that mass surveillance doesn't hamper the trust we, we need, etc. So, yes, we have, and we make use of our powers, but um, for the rest, I think it's safer to uh, rely then also on Strasbourg and on the European Court of Human Rights. That's the forum for the direct core national security competence. Uh, do you want to make a last, last statement? Um, maybe uh, okay. you. <laughs> okay, I will also say a few words about the general data protection regulation. I believe that we have uh, three challenges in privacy. This is new and cheaper technology, uh, rising of the value of, of data, and also globalization of data processing. And uh, I believe that the way, way of GDPR is the right, right way. Uh, it, brings, it brings more freedom to individuals to decide about their information. Uh, but of course, it will be, it will be a big challenge for, for national GDPAs uh, to enforce in praxis because one thing it is what is written on paper and, and the other thing I think what is what is in reality. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this will uh, conclude our uh, table uh, roundtable on uh, on uh, the future of uh, uh, data protection reform. Um, I would like to uh, conclude uh, with a small uh, statement on um, the fact that. Uh, data protection is uh, obviously something very important uh, and uh, we know that breaching privacy uh, can be a problem for uh, uh, people. We are talking about the difficulty of uh, making uh, people aware of the 
um, problem with data protection, with the, the protection of their data, their, their pri privacy. And um, usually the people who suffer the most of a privacy breach are the one who have the less uh, uh, awareness of these problems because uh, they are from a foreign country in difficult situation. Uh, they are uh, uh, very poor and uh, so most of the time the people who suffer from uh, weak data protection are the most vulnerable. Uh, so we have to um, make something for them even if we are not uh, in great danger ourselves if our privacy is attacked. So uh, thank you to all the participants uh, of this uh, panel and uh, we will now free the room for the next panel that is about to start, I think. Thank you. <laughs>